Okay, well, um, welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for, for joining us for this uh, tutorial session as part of the uh, Dublin Core 2022 conference. Um, my name is John Huck, and uh, I'm joined by Karen Coyle. Um, and we welcome you to this uh, workshop where we will be talking about the Dublin Core tabular application profile um, and demonstrating um, a Python tool that you can use with it. Um, and uh, showing some examples and there's an exercise. Um, so we're, we're hoping that this will be uh, interesting to you. Um, you know, I think we're certainly approaching this somewhat as a casual opportunity. We're, we're definitely looking forward to interacting with people and um, ask, uh, you know, so if, feel free to ask questions in the chat. I think when, when I'm talking, Karen's gonna be keeping track of the chat and vice versa. Um, or if you want to ask a question, um, I think maybe raise your hand on the Zoom, the Zoom hand, raise your Zoom hand, and, um, and then we will uh, uh, take your question if you want to ask it that way. Okay, so um, uh, here's the agenda, I guess, kind of broken out a little bit. Um, so I'm going to start by just introducing the basic aspects of DCTAP, um, and then I'll do a very brief demo of, of the Python application. Um, then we'll have a break, uh, and the break will be a chance uh, for anybody who wants to install the application. Uh, that'll just it'll allow time for that and for the inevitable troubleshooting that we'll probably have to do. Um, uh, and uh, and but it'll also give you a chance, for instance, to uh, to maybe you know take a closer look at some of the documents uh, that I share in in the first half, um, and maybe absorb you know just allow the details to absorb a little bit, um, and then in the second half, Karen will be uh, taking you through an exercise, showing some examples of more complicated uh, taps, uh, and then also I guess addressing other more, uh, com you know, more advanced topics. Um, so that that's the plan for today. Um, not sure whether this will take three hours or not, but but we've got lots of time. So um, and nobody's in a hurry. I'm, I'm not anyway. Um, okay, so uh, first, I'll just start by acknowledging the people who've been contributing to the DC application profiles working group over the last few years. Um, and I think a number of these folks are on in, in the room today, uh, so that that's great. There's there's lots of uh, institutional knowledge here, um, and uh, it's it, it, it's been an interesting process for me. I've, I know I've enjoyed just having very cerebral conversations about metadata because I don't get to do that with not everybody you can have those types of conversations with, um, and certainly we've also had contributions from people. Who have commented on our on the GitHub repo, and so we're we're grateful for uh, all those contributions as well. Um, so uh, just to give kind of orient you, these are some of the links also in the agenda, um, and I I'm just going to take a moment to kind of walk you through what some of these documents are that you might want to read um, uh, as you learn about DC Tab. Um, the first link is obviously to the working group page on the DCMI website. That's mainly there uh, in case you want to uh, subscribe to the mailing list um, or look at the mailing list archives. I think, um, I think that information is also on the GitHub repository, but it's, you know, conveniently on the on the working group page there. Um, and then the next link is, um, and sorry, I'm just going to start my timer there. Um, my, the, my, the next link um, is where most of the documents are going to be that you're going to want to look at. Um, so that's our GitHub repository. Um, and, um, and I'll take a minute in just a minute, I'll, I'll kind of go there and kind of scroll through those documents so you can see them. Um, the last link is the link to the Python application, uh, which was developed by Tom Baker, who I see is on the call here. Um, and so that's a separate repository. Um, and we'll be visiting that. Uh, hi, Tom. Uh, uh, later on to um, for people who want to install the application. 
Okay, so now I'm going to try clicking. And I hope, I think, do people see the, the GitHub repository? Yes, okay, great. Um, so this is this is the, the landing page and and you know the, the same the same list of kind of documents to look at are, are given on on the readme here a bit of an int introduction about um about the project um and so the primer is probably the one that you would want to start with first um in the sense that it it kind of introduces the project and the, and the elements um, in kind of a, a reader friendly format. So there's there's explanations um, and uh, examples, um, and so that's really the way that if, where, where you're if, if you're first approaching, you probably want to look at the primer first. Um, yeah, so it's it, it's obviously a bit of a longer one. Um, and then the the vocabulary document is the more cut and dried, I guess, technical uh, document where the elements are defined um, and and given a kind of uh, 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 their, their definitions, uh, which I guess is saying the same thing. Um, so that that's one that you might refer to, I guess, if if you if you want to look at a, at a more concise representation. Um, then there are also uh, examples, um, and I think Karen will be taking you through some of these. Um, and there is also a template. Um, I think this is the one. Um, and we also have, I think, a copy of this template in the tutorial folder of, of documents. And so you don't have, because it's a bit of a pain to download a CSV from uh, from GitHub, um, but that's there just to, to put that in that that format. Um, and then, um, if you find yourself reading the primer and and getting confused um, or uh, anything like that, you might want to and, and you want to take a break. You can go and read this shorter document, uh, which we came up with later. It's called "Talking About Metadata and Application Profiles." Um, and essentially, we we wanted to add this document um, just to kind of um, be a help for explaining some of the terminology and uh, that, that that we use and what we mean by certain terms. Um, we had to work through this ourselves in the group in order to make sure that we were all talking about the same thing. Um, and especially with metadata, you have that problem of of the instance data and then let's say the metadata about that or the metadata schema and then you might and then you might have other levels and, and a profile is you know one level above of abstraction above a metadata schema so there are many different meta layers and it can be easy to uh get wires crossed when you're talking about those things um so this this was um our attempt to uh and I think that's that's maybe what this last section, how to confuse yourself and everyone else, as when when you start talking about meta meta things. Um, okay, so that's that's that document, um, and I think that that's maybe as much as I want to uh, show. So let me just get back. Oh, the cookbook. Okay, well, I won't reopen, um, but but the cookbook is the other document, and that's in progress. Um, and the cookbook is, I guess, a place where we um, are putting instructions for how to do specific things with TAP. Uh, so beyond kind of the the, the basic functions, um, and and so that's obviously something that we would be looking to add to over time uh, and certainly if we're getting uh you know as we're we have the chance to talk with you today um that will give us the chance to hear about different use cases and um uh and essentially it, dc tap is a it, it it's a fairly simple set of uh of provisions and the idea is that 
you might use those that simple tool to solve different problems to try to do different things. So that's what the cookbook is for. Okay. So I'll just move on now to talking about um, just introducing metadata application profiles uh, very, very briefly. And um, and I know that there this is a, a topic that's been uh, you know written about extensively in 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 the past, and there was the Singapore framework and and so on. Um, so I won't be getting into that today, but but just really to set the stage for what we're talking about. Um, uh, what we are thinking about our uh, when we talk about a metadata application profile um, it is basically a, a, a document that defines a particular metadata practice. Um, so it uh, will be always a reuse of vocabulary terms that are defined somewhere else. Uh, so in a standard or uh, a formal vocabulary or schema. Um, and but uh, in the process of applying that, uh, metadata standard, um, um, you know, you, you want to document the way that, that you are implementing it, certain decisions that you might make to constrain certain properties um, um, or values and, and structures. Um, so that's that's our, certainly our assumption, our starting assumption um, with this, uh, with the DC tab. And why did why did we go the direction of a tabular apple, a tabular format? Um, and I think that really the the answer to that uh, is that a tabular format is uh, first of all it's it's easily understood by a, a wide range of professionals. Everybody from uh, you know a, a repository manager to uh, uh, to developers. Um, there there it's it's easily understood by by people with a wide range of, of technical skill um, and um, and also it's a format I think that a, a lot of people are using already um, to document their profiles um, and it's uh, at the same time that it's it's user friendly it's also obviously um, uh, very easy to get a CSV uh, from a table um, which can then uh, so it's it's adjacent, I guess, to being machine actionable. Um, from the CSV, you can then uh, take it to uh, more complex uh, uh, formats if you need to. Um, it can be the, imp the input for, for uh, elaboration in, in a more complex uh, language, for instance. Um, but really, I think that the, the underlying motivation was, was to make something that was easy to use um, and that, uh, uh, that that and that would allow it to be kind of more widely adopted. So um, we, I guess, you can think about the basic functions that it's designed to support, um, and it really starts with just listing, being able to list metadata properties that you want to use in your in your application, um, or your your use of the of the metadata. Uh, of, of a metadata vocabulary. Um, and so that really is the core of the tab, uh, just a list of metadata properties. Uh, but once you have that, you probably want to do a few other things. You might want to um, uh, make sure that, that, that it's that the, the profile is easy to read, um, that there, there's a label for the, the terms and that you can make annotations for each uh, property. Um, then you might want to do some very basic uh, definition of constraints. Um, so the cardinality of the property, um, you know, whether it can repeat or uh, uh, or not. Uh, and then you might want to also define some constraints for the values that that property would take. Um, the fourth, I guess, broad function that TAP supports um, is that it um, allows you to group together related properties um, that relate to you know some uh, resource that you're describing or some entity, um, and to gather them together as as a shape. And I'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, and I think one one broad thing, what broad point I guess that I want to make just to keep in mind is that uh, that this was developed with RDF metadata in mind, and we made a decision I think not to not to make it exclusively for RDF. Um, so certainly 
there's the possibility of of adapting tap to describe let's say like a database schema um, or xml um, metadata um, and there's some i think maybe some challenges just based on the difference in 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 the fundamental structure between rdf and xml for instance um, um, but it's um so it's not impossible but it but it, it's but we we definitely wanted it to be something that would be uh you know of use i think to the greatest number of people certainly a lot of metadata that's uh work that's being done now is being done with rdf properties so that was where we put the focus and um here are the 12 elements um and i've kind of i've divided them up into two parts um and, I've, and you'll also notice here that that it's possible to extend um dc tap by adding your own custom elements um and you'll hear more about that when when karen uh presents her her part a bit later um so i put all of the 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 properties that relate to uh, or rather all the elements i guess we're calling them elements um that relate to properties in the metadata that you want to include in your in your profile um, those are on the left and then there are two elements that relate to the shapes which uh which i'll get into a bit later um and so the i guess the thing that i want to that might kind of make it or that i, I want to point out about these is that some some of um, you know roughly half of the of the uh elements relate to uh to the property um and then the other half relate to the values that that property might take. Um, so then, in, in then in in, uh, in combination, then there's the, the the elements that relate to shapes, and then there's the possibility of custom elements. So um, I guess now I'll just go through these these elements and kind of talk through them, and I'll show you um, an example of uh uh you know on on the screen here um and then when i get to the end of that um i'll be able i'll uh eventually i'll i'll show you how i can take the csv for this example and run it through the python program in order to get output um, in another format so property id is the only element that's uh required everything else is optional um and really this is um it goes back to that that idea that the, the core of an application profile is a list of of um, pro of properties. That was kind of our conceptual understanding, um, and I think that uh, you know certainly you can you can imagine that as you're developing a profile that it's, it might be an iterative process. So you're you're starting, and so it's you know you might be starting from a simple list. You want to just sketch out. You know, okay, what, what what do I think we're going to do here? Okay, these are the basic elements we need to get, um, and that and and so that might not be the the ending point, but that might be the starting point for developing a more complex uh, tap. Um, and you might get you know feedback from your colleagues or from the team that you're working with, and then once once that starts to come into focus, you can add the other elements um, and uh, and go from there. So um, I think property label and note uh, are kind of self-explanatory. Um, the property label is is uh, obviously a, a human readable form of the of the property. And since again, since the assumption is this is generally RDF uh, properties, we know that it's it's either going to be an IRI or uh, you know a prefixed IRI, I guess, um, as the property ID. Sometimes those aren't uh very sometimes it can be opaque in their in their meaning you know um uh there might it, it might be a uh you know a numbered prefix for instance um i think that's the way that's the way wikidata properties are it seems to me um so so even from the point of view of understand of looking at a, a tap table and making sense of it the humans that that property label uh you know plays a role there um, and then the node field, of course, the, the node is probably the greatest metadata field ever created. Um, catalogers, uh, you know, we all we all live and die by the note field, and um, 
uh, and it's and but it's it's really that place for something that doesn't fit anywhere else. Um, so you uh, you might want some annotation about the way you're using that field or um, or constraint on the value of that field that that isn't easy to express in the other in the other elements. You can you can put that there. Again, you know I mentioned the possibility of of adding your own custom elements. So that you, you you might decide that certain pieces of information that are in the note field that it's enough of a, a use case for you to justify creating that custom element for yourself. Um, but yeah, no note, note field kind of self explanatory, I think. Um, and then um, we chose to represent cardinality as as two elements so mandatory and repeatable and it's a Boolean value. Um, that's the and and as we've defined it, that's that's how this would be represented. Um, I think we we talked about there's obviously many ways that you could represent cardinality, and and we discussed them and and ended on this one. I think for its simplicity, um, we know that obviously this is not going to be able to represent very complex and kind of conditional types of cardinality, um, but there are some ways to do that. Um, and I think those are uh, there's some of those are in the cookbook, um, and I think Karen might get to those. Um, and and really, we wanted something that was going to be simple to use um, out of out of the box for for a large set of cases. So that's the way that that's represented. Um, okay, so now we'll move on to the uh, to the elements that relate to um, to values. And um, and so uh, there are, I guess, the, these two these two elements here are kind of in a pair. Um, the value node type, so that um, the the node type of the value that's expected um, will take one of three values. And again, this is within the RDF framework. Um, uh, those are the types of nodes that you can have in, in RDF. So something is either an IRI, or it's a literal value, a, a string, um, or it's a blank node. Um, and um, so then the second element, the value data type, um, data types are specifically um, a type of a type of typing that, that relates to literal strings. So it, it doesn't apply to IRIs or blank nodes. Um, but if you're dealing with a literal value, um, then, um, then you might want to, you might want to type that. Um, RDF uses the, um, uh, the data types that are defined in, in XML schema. Um, and it also adds some, uh, I think, I think some some types of its own that are compatible with um, XML schema, and so those are the kinds that that we uh, that you can use in this in this column. Um, and I've I, I don't I, I just use the RDF lang string just purely for the sake of example. It's it, uh, it it's uh, yeah just to just to show you something a little bit different there. Um, okay. So um, then the last two columns, I guess, that, that relate to values um, are value constraint and value constraint type. Um, and in this case, you, um, uh, you know, you, you're, you're expecting some kind of a value and, um, and, and you, you want it to conform to a certain, to a certain pattern or, uh, or apply some other constraint like that. So these again, this is kind of a pair of elements that kind of work together. Um, in, the, in this example, you can see that, um, um, and, and on the next slide, I'll show you the kinds of constraints that we've defined as a kind of a basic starter set um, of constraints. But in this case, um, the first row here is showing that uh, that the constraint on that property is that um, it it must have an IRI that begins with id.loc.gov, um, so um, an IRI stem. And so in that sense, the name would be coming from that vocabulary, the IRI. Um, so really the, the, con the value constraint type allows, uh, you know, a processor to interpret what is in the, what's actually expressed as the value constraint. Um, so here are the four constraint types that we 
uh, we suggested. Um, so a pick list uh, would be, you know, a, a, a value essentially from a short controlled list. Um, an IRI stem, it's a similar idea, but, you know, coming from a particular uh, vocabulary domain. Um, you know, a uh, pattern would be for expressing a rejects expression, um, or you might want to specify a language tag. Okay, so I think I've, I've gone through all of the, the uh, elements that relate to, uh, to properties. Um, and, um, and at this point, I want to just kind of stop and, and to introduce a little piece of terminology that, that, um, uh, that we were using in the group. And I think it's also defined in those, in those documents that I was showing you. Um, and that's the, the concept of a statement template. So essentially, each row that relates to a property um, is, a, is a statement template. And, and this is a bit of an echo of uh, some of the uh, conceptual language that was devised for, for metadata, um, where metadata is a, is a statement. Um, and so this is a, a template for a statement, template for a metadata statement, um, each is each row. Um, yeah, and I think I, right, I left off, these are just some of the, some of the elements here. Um, so that's just, a, yeah, just keep that phrase in mind. Statement template is, is a row on, on the table. Okay, so now I'm going to uh, introduce the concept of shapes within uh, DC tap. Um, and I think on a, on a, uh, I'll just first say that, um, of course, shape is a concept that you will encounter in other uh, constraint languages and validation languages like Shex and Shackle. Um, and um, certainly, I think we're, we're kind of thinking along the same lines, but, um, but our use of that term is, uh, is, I guess, maybe a little bit looser. Um, so it's, it's, not, it's not kind of rigidly tied to one of the definitions in those, in those languages. Um, but we were trying to get at something that was just kind of the intuitive understanding of an entity that you have some information about, you know, and this is, you know, possibly the most basic example that you could show. You, you've got a book, and there's some information about the book, um, the title and the date, and, and then you have an author, and there's some information about the author that's, that, that you need to record, and um, and there's a relationship between between the book and the author, um, and um, and so we wanted, as I mentioned, one of the functions of the tap is to allow you to have this kind of modularity within your profile, um, and shape is the way that we accomplished this. Um, so this is a just a kind of, uh, I guess it's it's not quite the official definition of a shape with that we if, if you look in our vocabulary but it's but it's essentially again getting at that conceptual idea so a shape is a uh, a group of statement templates uh, you know and the, and the statement template is the row so a group of rows that describe a common resource you know and I think in, in the vocabulary we say that a shape is a group of statement templates that share a subject and are identified with the same shape ID um, and uh, this is maybe a little bit conceptual, but um, but the shape really is something that is that exists within the context of the tap. So it's not something that exists in the uh, in the or it's not defined in the instance metadata, for instance. Um, but it's it's a pattern that's that's defined within uh, within the DC tap, um, and many of you might be familiar with, of course, RDF has classes, and there's a structure of classes, and, and this is totally separate from classes. We don't, um, DCTAP doesn't address classes at, at all. Um, uh, I think kind of as a way of, of, of keeping things simplified and, and focused on the, on the properties. Um, okay, I think that's, I'm just checking my notes. I think that's everything I was gonna say about that. Okay, so here is uh, our example again, and I've just added a couple of columns to show the elements for shape ID and shape label. 
um, you know, just as you would as you might want a property label to help you read the tap for your properties, you might want a shape label uh, uh, to be, help people understand the shapes IDs that you have in your in your tap. Um, and the uh, the shape ID has to be a unique. It's a unique value. Um, but it only has to be unique within the context of the table um, because it's really only connecting different parts of the table. It's not meant to be, uh, you know, something that exists outside of that context. Um, it could be an IRI, um, you know, depending on how you're implementing things, that might be a convenient ID to use, uh, but it really just needs to be unique in the table. Um, and typically, I think that we um, you you would you, your your property. Um, let me see. Oh, I think I'm okay. Yeah, I had to. I have animation on this slide. <laughs> I forgot. Um, so anyway, there's the so in, in this example, you can see that these 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 properties are all part of a, a shape called book. Um, so there's a an author, a title, and a date of publication. Um, and you can see that we've defined the the author to be uh, the value of, of the author um, uh, property um, to be an IRI, um, but we've also associated a shape with it, and we're saying that uh, that 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 would correspond with the person's shape. Um, and so further down in the same table. Um, um, then you can see that we define shape uh, or that, that the, uh, the properties that belong to the person shape are then given down below. Um, and uh, I think that you, you, you have the option either to repeat the shape ID and the shape label on each row for each property if you wanted to. Um, but I think the way that we've uh, uh, defined this and the way it's been implemented in the Python app um, you have the option as well of just giving it on the on the first row of the property um, or, or the the row of the first property of of the shape uh, kind of as I've shown here. Um, okay, I think that um, the, uh, yeah, I guess the, the only other thing that I would just mention is that you probably wouldn't have a property that took a literal value. And which also corresponded to a shape. Um, it would typically either be an IRI or a B node. Again, it this has more to do just with the way that the that type of structure would be uh, created within RDF. Um, but that's I think that's kind of a kind of an, a, a safe assumption to make. Okay, so um, moving on then. Um, uh, you know, I think just kind of summing up a little bit about uh, you know what I've talked about so far. Um, really, I think we see DC Tap as being a metadata modeling worksheet, um, and so sometimes metadata uh, schemas or, or standards will be represented in a in a diagram or maybe in uh, in a schema document like like an XML schema document or um, or in a table, or maybe in a document with paragraphs that, that defines elements, um, it can be represented in, in different ways. Um, and really, the I think the benefit of, of DC Tap is that is that you can take metadata that's described in any of those ways and bring it into this table, um, and and um, and then uh, kind of have a have a common common view of it. So it's it's not necessarily going to be a, a perfect solution for every case, um, but it does, uh, as I say, provide a, a consistent approach that you can use in, in many different cases, um, and it allows you to sketch out. I think really the the, the basic um, things that you want to capture right off the bat, um, and uh, then the the CSV output from the table can then be kind of an on ramp. Onto uh, to uh, this, this the the kernel or the starting point for creating more complex documents that you might require for your for your uh, for your purposes. Um, and so uh, there are a few uh, some of the examples that are in the in the 
on GitHub, um, I believe, um, show, um, yeah, just different different projects that are looking to try to model their uh, their uh, metadata using DC tap. Um, okay, so um, really the 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 linchpin I think that that's going to uh, allow people to use the CSV output in, in many different ways is this DC tap Python application, which I'll be demonstrating in just a minute. Um, and the um, so this just gives you kind of a diagram of, of you know, the, the kind of the, the workflow for that. You've got the table, you can create a, a CSV from that. The CSV is the input for the DC tap Python application. Um, and then that allows you to, uh, it does some basic checking and allows you to create um, uh, output in JSON, YAML, or text, um, which could be the basis for, for input forms or validation or, or some other purpose. Um, so uh, it can be customized with a configuration file. And I think Karen will be talking about that. Um, does some basic checks on, on the table. Um, and then, it, uh, uh, as I say, it, it outputs in, in a few different formats. Uh, and it was developed by, by Tom Baker. Okay, so here is the, uh, this is the example kind of taken together that, um, uh, that I've been showing through the slides. Um, it's the, it's a Google Sheet in, in the tutorial folder that we have for today. Um, and there's also, a, just for convenience, a CSV file there as well of it if you want to download it. Um, and so I will be uh, processing that in just a minute. Um, but this just uh, shows the, uh, right, kind of sums up the, the example that I've been showing. Um, and um, I wanted to just put screen caps in the slides um just for anyone who's watching it later um that this is uh this is you know examples of the output um so on on the left hand side that's that's the text output that's just uh being uh out output uh to the terminal and on the on the right that's a, a json file that was created um and the instruction is a little bit different um i just added a uh uh, you just have to add the add the pipe to uh, to tell uh, the, the tell the program to save it to a file, uh, which is uh, kind of standard standard bash. Um, okay, so we're gonna do the break. I think what it, or what what I'll do is I'll I'll just um, stop sharing my screen, and this is gonna not take very long. Um, I'm just gonna, uh, but. But there's nothing like a live demo to make you feel important. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna do this this live demo from my... make you afraid, very afraid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. We're gonna test the waters here. Um, okay, so here I am. Um, you know, I've I've created a folder, and I've already downloaded the example DC tap tutorial. Example one, um, and if I tap, if I type DC tap, then it gives me basic uh, commands uh, right off the bat um, and uh, instructions about how to how to do the initialization. Um, there's extensive documentation on on read the docs, um, and that's I would encourage you to uh, to look at that. Um, so I'm going to, uh, I think I'm just going to do, I'm, I'm just going to do a, a conversion to, um, just in the, in the, in the terminal window here. Okay. So we want, let's do YAML and, um, there's the, there's the file. Um, hit go and and there there you can see it's it's representing that uh the that that csv in in yaml um why don't we just take a look at what 
what the JSON output would look like. And there you can see the JSON. So it's 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 not very complex. It's doing kind of a, a fairly basic function. Um, uh, but um, but but that but that really is a it it, it will give you that flexibility to um, uh, to take take something from the CSV and then start working with it in a different format right away. Okay, so now I will go back to sharing the slides. Okay, so that's that's kind of that's that's the the whirlwind tour, um, and so now I think we were gonna we're gonna take a break, um, and we were thinking fifteen minutes, um, and this will be your opportunity to uh, to if, if you if you are so inclined to install the the program yourself, um, and the the instructions are on the GitHub uh, repository page. Um, the first option. Is probably uh, this. It's it's the simplest option of how to install it. Uh, installation from PyPI. Um, Python three point seven is required, um, and there's a I think there's an instruction on the uh, on at that link about how to check what version of Python you may have installed, um, and you may also be prompted to update pip, which is the mechanism that that um, that Python uses to get that. Um, and I believe Tom is here and I think there's, there's you know, uh, on the chat, um, you know, certainly let's, let's do some collective troubleshooting for anybody who needs help uh, getting it installed that wants to. Um, and other than that, I, I would just you know, invite you to, uh, yeah, take a look at, at some of the documentation on, on GitHub during the break. Um, and as uh, and also maybe just think about you know based on what you know so far about tap um, you know think about your own metadata needs um, how you might like to apply it um, is there something that you want to be able to do that that you're not sure how you could do or maybe you're wondering if tap could help you accomplish that um, and uh, and I there'll be uh, you know just yeah think think about those questions and. Uh, and uh, the second half, I think, will be more interactive. Um, Karen, am I am I missing anything, or is that? Is that I good? I don't think so. No, um, I'm. I think we. Uh, let's just take a break, think about things, ask questions, um, whatever you, whatever you think whatever comes to your mind at this point, and then we'll get into just a few more, not a whole lot, more, a few more kind of um, what ifs kind of, uh, kind of things, you know, I wanna do this or what if I wanna do that? Just a little bit of that because it could go on forever. But, yeah. uh, but we definitely would like to hear yours. So as we go along, you can think of things like, how would I do this? you know, say so, and, and we'll see if, if we know of a way. Okay, let's give it 15 minutes. Okay, yeah. Uh, there you go, okay. <laughs> Sunny did, <laughs> okay. Great. Okay, so um, just for folks who are watching this uh, later on, um, and we've just come back from a break, and, and there was definitely some troubleshooting going on on the chat during the break, um, and and there there is there are some kind of discrepancies between different versions of the program that that some folks are running into. So um, the recommendation our recommendation is that um, that you go to the GitHub page, and then you do the installation from GitHub. Um, so that's uh, part way down the page, and that'll bring the current version of the that that should you should get the current version of the program that way, um, and that version of the program uses the command read, um, and again if you type dc tap, you will bring um, it'll just show you the options, um, and and that's really where you, where you can go. The older version of the program used dc tap generate. 
Um, so just be aware of those things. Hopefully we can get these ironed out in the various places by the time people are, are watching this recording. Um, and, uh, but uh, with that, I will hand it over to Karen. Okay, great, thank you. So you have to stop screen sharing. Yes. There we go, so that I can right. share my screen. Sure, my screen is shareable here. <laughs> I, that I don't have anything uh, untoward going on here. <clears throat> okay, so we're back to the uh, the agenda here, and the the page that has all of the materials on it. And what I want to talk to you about is extending DC tap. Now we are very aware that DC tap is very simple. It is a core in the in the grand philosophy of Dublin core, which means that we think it's a good way for people to get started, but you have to assume that you can extend it. So there are no we aren't limiting you to what we have in DC tap, it is a beginning. So there are two primary ways to extend it. And I hope that people have, have come up with ideas for extensions. Um, and that is adding, um, adding columns and adding elements, adding elements such as values, like in different values in value constraint type. So DC tap has a lot of uh, possibilities that you may not see just looking at it directly. Now we wanted to do a, um, an exercise and let me find where we are. There we are in the agenda. So in the spirit of looking at DC TAP and thinking about what you might want to do, um, and if anybody at this point wants to try doing one with their own data, that's fine. There probably is a time here. So we thought we would give you a uh, short example to work on. Uh, during which you can ask us questions if it doesn't make sense to you or if there's something that you haven't quite, you know, it's different when you start doing it. So in the tutorial folder, which I will get back to uh, in the exercise folder, we have an exercise for you. And you probably want to open that up on your own screen to be able to look at it. It's in the exercise folder. Can people get there? Is anyone having trouble finding that? So this is a very simple example of a book that is represented by a book shape an author that is represented by an author shape and a publisher that is represented by the publisher shape. This key gives you the cardinality that is to be expressed. Um, you have here both the data element, DCT author and the label, you could change these labels. Labels are entirely up to you. Um, so the book shape has an author shape and a publisher shape. Now a way we've provided a, hopefully a um, simple way for you to do this. You can either open up a Google template directly from here if you prefer to work in Excel, you can open up a template. This opens up, well, um, you can download this and open up an Excel template. Uh, what the templates look like are this, they give you all of the um, 
all of the columns, you don't have to use them all. You can delete the ones you don't want to use. So there's, as um, John was saying, just about everything here, everything in, in, uh, in DC tab is optional, but this just gives you kind of a template to work with. So as an exercise, is this, uh, are people, um, are people up for this? Have we lost you? Do you want to, do you want to do this? Can you exercise? See if you can figure out how you would fill in a DC tap using this metadata information. And um, I think that we Karen, can give you like- if I may interrupt. Yeah. There is a, in, in the chat, you're sharing your whole screen. So this makes reading the slides a tad difficult. It, I have the same problem because I'm on the notebook. So oh, if you okay. Share just so the I can window, stop it would share and I can much... just share. Yes. Okay. Let me do that then. Let me go ahead and do that. Just share that window. I always have to find the window. Same here on a notebook. It's horrible. Yeah. Does that? make it Wonderful. a little bit better. Yes, yeah, yes, you, much again, better. you probably have to open this up yourself because it, it is kind of detailed. So you may want to, you know, go off and open it on your own out on a different window. And if you have a separate, a different screen, it would be really helpful, but sounds like maybe you don't at this moment. Um, and see, uh, and as you try to do this, if you have questions, please ask, because that's exactly what this, uh, exercises for is to see whether you can, with this information, uh, sit down and create a tap. So I'm looking to see if anyone is uh, putting in the chat. We won't be able to see that you're actually doing it, but I hope you do. Did we work out the uh, issues? Tom probably had to go to sleep. If it's okay, because we can just do it. <laughs> Poor Tom. Yeah, I think the most error messages or anything in the chat have been cleared up. Okay. So it's just a misunderstanding. If you run the program with an empty template, it gives a weird error message that a, a column is missing. Maybe Tom can put this on the GitHub issues that the, the software, the program should check for. Like if there's no data in the file, it should die more gracefully or give a more informative. Oh, okay. <laughs> So, Marcus, was, you're, you're, you're suggesting that it should say something else, um, that uh, there's no data to process or yeah, something like that? something like that. So it was just, I, I did the same, like I, I downloaded the folder and I was thinking, oh, there's a CSV, let's read it. And I tried to read it. So I got exactly the same error messages. Uh, there's at least one or two other people in the chat. Okay. So this stumped me like, oh, did I install it wrong? What what happens here? And again, I looked at the file and oh, it's empty. It's just the header. So oh, that's the reason. It's of course right. expecting data. You and... were okay. You were doing just the header file. Yeah. Well, I yeah. have an actual um, real file. I found I, I'm still getting errors. So I found that the files expert. in the examples folders didn't work either, and they don't have that leading colon in the uh, the ID columns. I think one of them has actually that pound sign. That, 
That shouldn't be uh, needed. Okay, maybe that's a different issue. Yeah, then. the IDs um, can I really be any string. Okay. Um, and I also had another so question. Wish... Yeah. Sorry. Um, would you what? put the prefix URIs into the scheme in some way, or is that documented in a separate file? I'm just curious about that. Oh, we went over that a lot. Yeah, that yeah. has to be documented in a separate file. We couldn't figure out a way to get it into the table without either extending the table a great deal or reusing the, the table columns for more than one. So that okay. is simply something that you have to provide as documentation someplace. Uh, that, I mean, in the uh, program, it can be... Uh... Uh, handled in the configuration file. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I, th I think that any program that processes this would need to have those, the, the prefixes mean, but within the tap itself, we didn't find a place to do that. People could put in full URLs, how ugly and awful that is. So, um, so we sort of leave that as a next step. And it has a magic way of us getting it into the tap. We gladly hear it. We tried all kinds of things. Any other questions as you're? Karen, I can just, um, I, I can just confirm that I've, um, I, I, I've, I've tested out the three examples that are in the examples from GitHub um, folder, and uh -huh. uh, and so two of them two of them read okay, um, but I can confirm that the um, the simple book two um, mm -hmm. it does it does throw an unusual error. It says that it must okay. have a property ID column, and it does apparently have a property ID column. Okay, yeah, uh, yeah. So that's a All mystery. Right. Yes. Okay. Well, we will, I think we'll just live with mysteries at this point. Um, and the fact is that although there is this Python program and we're very glad to have it and it helps you understand how you move, you know, a visual table to a CSV to, you know, processable code. Uh, in fact, there can be any number of programs that run off of this CSV. So what, what, itself is produced is a, a CSV file that has a particular uh, has particular semantics. Um, the, the program which we were hoping um, will you know export those at the CSV to things like JSON and YAML, but there there could be other other programs that do the same thing. So is anyone? Karen, um, I, I'm not sure if I, it sounds like your voice might be breaking up a bit. Um, I'm not sure if it's a microphone issue or. Probably not... it's an internet. I doubt if there's anything I can do about it. Yeah. I'm, okay. Yeah. It's, it's not, it's not um, fatal yet. Okay. <laughs> let me, let me know when I die. <laughs> So has anyone tried doing the uh, this exercise and have you run into any problems or questions? I ran into a question as to what you would think about this. I, I think I was working through just kind of testing them. And so under the, um, on the first value of the book, hold on, I'm looking at two screens here. Mm, that's okay. So the first value or the first row of the book under the value shape, I put author, right? Because it is related to the author. Is that how it would link together? Or is right. it- Right, yeah. Yeah, the book okay, shape then, would have to have an author element that then links to the author shape. Okay. And I know and that this says DCT author, and I don't think there is a DCT author. So I think it's creator, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> and 
Um, but then does it link back? Does the author link back to the book through that same column? Or is it just a one directional link from book to author? It's, it's one directional, although um, how you hand, in other words, if you handle that as being, um, what are they, uh, transitive, there's, there's nothing stopping you from doing that. But in the, um, in the tap itself, it's, it's just a simple one, one link to another. Okay, thank you. Ah, okay. so we'll, we'll, let's go through some of these things and then, and at the end, if people want to stay and play with the program, we can do that because I can see how that can take up all of our time <laughs> to avoid that. So um, the uh, answer to the case you, uh, I haven't already discovered that. That size directly to this simple book. Too, because we've done simple book many times in the <laughs> in in the. So you have a book, and you can you can call these any you want. I mean, I think people to understand you could call the shape idea you call it you know i don't know gilman or something i mean you want as long as the things within the table book has a uh has uh um bits of information uh there are a lot of properties that describe the book. One of the properties that describes the book is DCT Creator, which is mistakenly author in the diagram, but that's you know what it meant. Right? And then that links to the author shape. And then the uh, then that the author shape. I'm pointing at my screen. You can't see me pointing at my screen. So that links to the shape, and then the. The authors, this value shape and this shape just have to be the same string. So then you have your author, you have information about the author, and book shape also has publisher. And because you say something more about publisher, not just that it is the publisher and you want to give a string, then you create a shape for that. And you can give, for example, and the location. So it's, it's very simple. It's somewhat hierarchical. Uh, possible that people could do multiple hierarchies. We haven't been there yet. Some nice trick in, in using this on just the simplest. Let us know because we're 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 really wanting to gather together all of those um, those examples. And essentially what it comes down to is works, works. Like Dublin Core, the, there is, there's gonna be no details. You can do what you want. Uh, we're providing this, this basis functions and you can do anything else functions for you. So that's really what it comes down to. This basis we feel covers a, a, a lot of the functionality that might be needed, that is needed for profiles, and th that might help people who are creating uh, profiles maybe for the first time give them some guidance. It's like a template, it gives them guidance for what they need to do. Okay, so now let me. So in terms in terms of extending 
So you've seen what, you, what we have basically in the tap. In terms of extending, what can you do? Well, again, you can do anything that works. You have to document it if you expect anyone else to understand it, of course. And the main extensions are adding columns and adding values. And let me show you, oops, not that one, but this one. So this uh, DC tap tutorial sheets give is just a lot of examples of different kinds of very simple DC taps. It covers much of what um, John talked about showing from properties to adding labels, doing things like data type and cardinality. And I've also done a few to show extensions. So a very simple extension, if I can get to it here. Let's say that you, rather than doing mandatory, just saying mandatory and repeatable, you want, want to say it's repeatable, but only three times. Well, there's two different ways you can do that. You can create your own column and say, you know, the maximum occurrence is three, if you'd like. Um, Opt or you could also add a value constraint of your own, one that we haven't defined yet. And um, we've already added a few new value constraints that we thought were useful, like max length and that type of thing. Um, but the value constraint, you can have the value constraint as a number and the value constraint type um, saying what type you want to call it that's going to work for you. Now, the difference between these two, of course, is if you add a column and you have a lot of things that are columns, um, and this is something that only pertains to like one or two of your properties, then you're adding a lot of columns. Uh, and as you have seen, I'm sure, that you know, with 12 data elements already, it's very hard to get the table onto a single screen and to make it readable. So adding columns is something that you would do mainly for something that is um, you can't do in any other way. The um, adding a constraint can be just for one single data element, for one single property. So this is one way that you can uh, well, actually two ways that you can extend and you should feel free to extend as you need to. The other thing that, that has come about and, um, and some of the members of our group have done, and I'll, sh I'll show you some in a, in a moment, have done some really interesting things with uh, rows and multiple rows for a property. So we know that the rows, which are the statement templates, exist within shapes. Now you can obviously reuse a property in more than one shape. If you want to have DCT um, creator in more than one shape, that's not a problem. Uh, so the, the, the context is from the shape to the row. Where it gets complicated is what, it, what a row means within the shape. And each row is evaluated on its own in terms of the logic of the tap. And you can have Within one shape, you can have more than one row with the same property. And I'm gonna show you a few examples. And you can imagine how tricky this gets to be because you have to be very careful, especially with your mandatory, uh, that you don't cr create for yourself a situation that as you would read through the tap, that you have a situation where you um, you always have a, I guess you, we would call it kind of a false result. In other words, you, you will never get a match 
in relation to your um, to your metadata. So for that, so th there's one thing that's really simple, no problem, and that is that if you want to say uh, that something is a um, that something is of a class, you want to add RDF classes, that's no problem. You can add RDF classes. RDF classes, in theory, relate to the shape. So those don't create a problem. But what you might want to say is, oops, you can't really read that, can you? Let me move this over. You might want to say, Okay, I have my metadata and it can be a DCT creator, but it could also be SDO, uh, schema.org artist. This is probably not so much useful for the creation of your metadata, but if you are ingesting someone's metadata. So if you're taking in metadata, you might say, I accept either one of these. And in these, you can still have, as long as the rules for these two things that you've in, included here as alternates, they must have the same constraints all the way through the statement constraint, or it doesn't work. So in this case, we're having creator or artist and both of them are stems from IRI.gov authorities. So the IRI stem is one of the really, uh, very, want to be very, one of the very useful um, types of, oh dear, this said property ID all the way across. Well, that obviously was, happened when I did a copy paste, but you know what I'm talking about. Um, so you, they can, you can use more than one, you can assign more than one property as long together, as long as they conform to the same statement template. And we have decided for us, and again, you can always violate this rule, but we have decided that logically, when you have more than one thing in a cell, that's an or. So you're saying, creator or artist can be this. Now it becomes a little different when um, the constraints are going to be different. And very early on, we were asked, especially by people doing, uh, I believe, bib frame. Well, what do you do if my rule is that my author could be either an IRI or it could simply be a string. Well, you can't do that in the way that, um, that we did the previous example, because these are two things that need different rules. And the rules could be very specific. Um, I'm showing you sort of, you know, <clears throat> general rules. They could be very specific. Um, so, if you said I have a creator and it can be either an I or I or a literal, and then you say it has a value constraint of I or I stem, that doesn't work for the literal. In those cases, you can provide the same property more than once, once as an I or I with all of, with whatever constraints you want for that, and once as a literal with whatever constraints you want with that. Um, so these, again, you have to um, look at things like if you, if you make them both um, mandatory, then you, you have to have both. It isn't an either or. And getting, a, getting true if then else kind of or logic into the tap really is not what the tap was intended for. So if you have complicated relationships between 
properties or between shapes, you probably need to do that someplace else. At the same time, the tap might help you sort of lay out uh, visually and for humans what it is you're trying to do. But the, but the complex logic, and especially, for example, the complex logic that comes up in things like Shep's, Shex and Shackle um, is, is beyond what we're attempting here. Or is another one that's, uh, that's difficult. So you can say, and this was an interesting example, and these are the kinds of examples we're wanting to gather. So it's, it's great to sort of experiment with TAP. Uh, and, and we're trying to find out what its limits are. And, and we're finding interesting ways that people can um, make use of it for things that are not just a, a very simple flat kind of uh, table kind of concept, but, a, but using more advanced logic. So this was one in which we have two properties, a, a schema address and FOF email. It says that it's mandatory. And what's mandatory? Well, because we're saying that more than one thing in a cell is an or, that what's, what is true here is that it either address or email is what is mandatory. Now you may decide to write code that does something entirely different with this type of example, but this we feel still fits in with the, the kind of concepts that we have writing behind TAP, even though we are very much um, avoiding getting into highly formalized rules. I mean, I don't wanna have anything that uses all those funny little characters like you see in the RDF documentation. So, um, so this works if, if you understand it. And as I said, if it works, it works. And what we want people to do with this is what works for them. So in this case, we have, it can be either address or email, and then the next two lines are email and address with information about them. So uh, email is gonna be a literal and address a string. Neither one of them is mandatory on its own because one or the other of them is mandatory. So I hope that this sort of stimulates you in terms of thinking how if you're reading a tap and, and Tom's program does this. So uh, he, he, he was one of the ones who, became, who was very conscious of our need to, um, of, of how the, the tap flows. And so how the tap flows is that you're reading it one row at a time. The row may or may not be within a shape and the row itself is a statement template. So I gave you those examples and of properties and or um, again, one of the important things about or is that within cells and there are multiple values, we are considering those an or. Multiple values, if you wish, you can um, assign in the config file of the Python program, you can say what your separator is. This is a bit complex because um, for most people, for example, and when they're, if they're doing a pick list, and pick list is one of our options, uh, pick list, I, I think the, <clears throat> the most natural thing is to separate them with a comma. Well, then of course you're in a comma delimited CSV uh, and, and that can get tricky. Most of the spreadsheet programs handle that well by putting uh, quotes around them, but you may wanna use a different separator. 
You may want to use the pipe. You may want to use something else. You may want to use just a blank. Um, although obviously not if any of your values are going to have blanks in. Them. Now we have had questions about using multiple sheets. And this is interesting. So there, there I can think of a lot of different reasons why in your spreadsheet program, and many of the people, most people I think are going to be thinking about spreadsheet program rather than the CSV, which is the output. So the spreadsheet program kind of encourages you to use multiple sheets. And I can see a number of different way, reasons to do that and ways that you would do it. Um, <clears throat> you could create, for example, a separate sheet for each shape. And then those shapes, if you wanted to, you could reuse them in a different uh, tap in a different um, profile. The thing with that is, is that they, if you're going to just throw them together into a CSV, of course, you have to make sure that they have exactly the same columns. And I'm going to show you one where that's not the case. Um, you may want to define allowed values for your cells for the input part of it, and those can either be on a separate sheet or you could, uh, if your spreadsheet program has that facility, you can um, add those in. The, um, yeah, and again, if, if your headers aren't identical, then you're going to need to do something to bring these all together. So let me show you if I can remember where we put it. Oh, I know it was in the agenda. Come on, agenda. There we go. So this is an interesting use of tap. Oops. That has different different shape different CSV files for different things. And this is done by Phil Barker, who has had a real interest in being able to say more about the shapes. And therefore, he has created examples that have multiple, that, that have a file for the shapes and a, I mean, a CSV or a spreadsheet for the shape and a spreadsheet then for the actual, um, for the actual data. And this is, we have struggled quite a bit with whether or not shapes, there should be more to be, that you could say about the shapes themselves, having some shapes be mandatory and or um, others not, uh, some shapes not be repeatable. Some people would like to indicate what is the, the top shape, the thing that you have to start with. So this is another possibility. I don't know if we're, as a group, if we're going to get into defining this, but if people make use of this type of thing, we would like to use these as examples to show people what they can do. <clears throat> um, and this was an example that, that was used for, uh, that was used to, to convert from a tap that has been exported in CSV and run through the Python program to Shackle. So I should say here just a little about DC tap and its relationship to validation. So DC tap itself does not do validation. It provides the some, at least some, maybe all, 
in your case, but maybe in others, um, some uh, examples, <clears throat> excuse me, if you have some of the rules that you might need for validation uh, without actually being a validation language. Uh, validation language would be very formal, it would be very strict. We aren't expecting the, the tap to be that strict. However, uh, Tom is working on some tap to checks. Uh, Phil is working on tap to shackle. And Nishad, uh, who's also in, in our committee, is working on uh, some tap to, sh to uh, checks. And actually, I haven't looked at Nishad's. So maybe we could do that and see. Seems that this is an active, uh, active app. Mm. Well, it's being slow, so we'll just go back to where we were. So, um, so we're hoping that that tap can be used in the in the in these environments, or where people are intending to move into these environments of validation. Um, without it providing the, the validation itself. For, for example, one of the things that I know that Phil has added um, is information about the severity which um, <clears throat> Shackle uses, and also information about what is the, the basic node that, that I can't remember what it's called, the target node, I believe it's called in Shackle. Um, and so that information can be added into the tap if that's what you're aiming for. At the same time, you know, this that may be your uh, tap bis because it depends on your audience. If you're working with your metadata people and they and you know they lay out what they see as the metadata, you may then later want to add on to the tap some of these other features, but they aren't required. And they really depend on, on what you expect to do with the data downstream. So that's basically what I had to present. Um, I was going to present the, um, the how you make these changes in the uh, uh, DCTAP YAML file, the config file. I'm not confident to do that at this point, but I could, because um, I just keep getting errors. So, <laughs> but I can show the, the config file and show, um, Yeah, I, things are not working for me here. Okay. If I can get this running, I will. Uh... No, it's not doing it for me. Okay, so I'm just gonna stop sharing that and I'm gonna share this and I may need help with this, anyone who can. <laughs> so this is the, the configuration file. Oops, there's all the errors that I was getting. This is the configuration file. And in the configuration file, there are various places where if you wish, you can say, I've, you can say what you've added so that you don't get warnings, you don't get any, any messages about something that isn't expected. The, the basic DC tap expects what we have uh, in DC tap, the, the column headers and some of the values. You can see that it uh, can give you the prefixes, you can add or uh, prefixes if you want, you can <clears throat> assume these. 
it, you can, there's a place where you can say more about shapes, although I have to say we haven't really concluded what we think we can say about shapes on their own. Where was I? This is an area, the extra statement template elements is where you can add the headers for any columns that you have added. So for example, I showed max occurs um, and there, and that would be, my error might be that I typoed this. Um, <laughs> at, so that you can, you can say what, what your new column headers are. You can, where's the other one? <clears throat> you can add value node types if for some reason you wish. Uh, we have members who uh, are, are using checks and like the, like the non-literal terminology. So you could, you could definitely do that. You can add aliases for any of the headers. So, you know, as we, we know that these, um, these headers get to be quite long. And if you wish to change them, either to shorten them, if you wish to do them in your own language, that's fine. You can do that. Uh, and by having them in here, the, um, the program won't complain about them. And Tom, yes. Yeah, I, I just wanted to uh, comment that um, the um, um, this program is is the whole program is really uh, designed uh, to be a first step um, in um, processing a DC tap um, with it, it sort of assumes a downstream. Um, application like Shex or Shackle that is um, doing something with it like validation. So um, what the uh, purpose of the, the purpose of the configuration file is um, to tell it not to protest um, if it sees uh, things that are not in the base model and just pass right. them through uh, and not give error messages. That's, that's really kind of the philosophy of the, of the program. Yes, thank you, Tom. And then one other thing that we saw that we thought people might want to do is um, we've defined mandatory and repeatable as, as Boolean. The standard Boolean values are true, false, and one, zero. But a lot of people want to say yes or no. Or again, you may want to put it in your own language. So you could, that, that's another thing that that you can do, but that you can also let the program know so that it passes it through. But all of these are changes that you can make to, to tap. Again, it's there as a template to help people think about their profiles, to develop their profiles. It's not intending to constrain what you can do in any way. All right, so I will stop screen sharing because we'll see what we want to and maybe this is do next. <laughs> <laughs> um, Tom, I, I, I um, th there was a question in, in the chat earlier on in the session um, about running the program in, in a Jupyter notebook environment. Uh, and I'm wondering if I, I think maybe that that person had to leave, but but just for uh, anyone else who might be interested, um, if you have anything you can say about that. Um, well, uh, yes, I mean, I um, um, have um, uh, put this uh, command line inter interface onto um, a number of uh, functions, but um, I, I think the functions can just be imported um, into a Jupyter notebook and used um, uh, without having the command line interface. So um, uh, maybe we should um, uh, prepare some uh, Jupyter notebooks that, uh, that do it that way. Yeah. Yeah, we can stick them up on the GitHub site. People can use them. Yeah. 
Great, thank you. Any other questions that have come up about about all about the logic of tap and what we're intending and what you can do with it? or something that you see that you think you can't do with it. Is everybody past midnight? Is that, <laughs> is that the problem? Um, I see there's been a lot of talk about the, the I, I knew the program would get people going and that we, <laughs> that's, that's where everyone gets trapped. And if, you know, if, if you wanna play around with the program more, that's great. Um, you know, we'd be happy to hear about your experiences. I'm sure Tom would be really interested to hear uh, how people use it. And especially if anybody, um, makes any modifications. And I see that Ben has a, Ben has a hand up. Oops, let me see, got to unmute. There we are. There we are. Yeah, I, I don't have any great questions right now, but I've really enjoyed this. I'm so glad I've had the chance to kind of return to this for a day. And thank you all so much. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm I'm very excited about the possibility for like a sort of a common way to share profiles using this, and um, we're starting we're starting kind of continuing work, um, creating some RDA profiles in Sinopia and looking at RDA cataloging after 3R and just trying to figure out what a RDA linked data implementation would look like. So. I'm very excited to share that as DC tap at some point um, and hope to be able to follow up. I think it's fairly far off for us because there are just so many questions about how we should model things first. And, and that's really what we're and, dealing with. And it's with. a huge <laughs> metadata set, you know? I mean, and it's, it's a gigantic, gigantic metadata set, yes. Yeah. Um, I could show you a couple of, uh, of different metadata um, schemas that we've played with that I don't think we've shown you this yet. And let me, let me find, it's always hard to find it. There we go. So in the examples, we have done things such as this is the data catalog um, that has a lot of different application profiles. And um, just so that you can see how, how long and complex a profile can be. I mean, this is quite realistic, I think, that, that you can, I mean, this just goes on and on. And yet, you know, this is a reasonable, um, a reasonable metadata schema. There's, there's you know, nothing uh, terribly unusual about it, but uh, you can see that we were able to do that with a tap. Let me find another interesting example. Um, this was uh, particularly interesting because this is an attempt <laughs> that John and I wrangled with quite a bit. It's an attempt to create a DC tap out of something that's actually an XML schema. And that becomes really tricky because you've got the difference between the elements and the attributes and, and all of that. But we, we have been working a bit with the data site people to see if, if their information could um, be made into a DC tap. Oops, and then I, let me see what else we might have here that's and Karen wiki data. Yeah. Um, yeah, and, and that that's kind of an interesting example because you and I both we both made an attempt at modeling, and and we and we came at it from different approaches, and we ended up with something different. Um, you know, I was I was starting from the XML schema document, and you started from the uh, from the kind of the the documentation, um, and. So I think you know our conclusion was well this this is interesting um, and 
Um, and it really is a question of, uh, you know, you, you might have to make certain choices about how you want to adapt TAP. And we're not saying that there's, there's one way that's, that's right or not. It, it kind of depends on what, what you hope to do. But um, mm -hmm. with that, yeah, with XML, maybe that, the, the, that, that, you know, the, the, the fact that you might end up with, with quite different representations um, is maybe more uh, something you, I think you would run into more with, with XML, which has a very, has the totally different data structure rather than, uh, you, you might not run into that as much with, um, with RDF vocabularies. Mm -hmm. Or maybe not even with JSON. I mean, XML schema has, has a lot of complication. You know, yeah. there's um, we've looked at Wikidata because we did hear a bit from some Wikidata folks, and then the the question being whether we can you know move from this directly into the Wikidata um, profile format. But uh, we did uh, a couple of those, and then this will make Ben laugh probably. Um, <laughs> I'm trying to remember which one. I, I grabbed just some instance data from uh, RDA and, you know, basically tapped it up like this. It's it was just a tiny chunk, but uh, I wanted to see what it looked like. So um, if you have, you know, metadata schemas and you would like us to look at and see whether we think we could get them into or, or get parts of them into TAP, DC TAP as, a, as an exercise. Uh, just get in touch because this is, this is in, we're still learning the, the various ways that people might make use of this and we're still learning about some of the questions that come up. And so every time that we've tried to work with somebody's data, we've learned a lot. Okay, I lost the, uh, <clears throat> I, I, I lost the, uh, 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 the chat. Do we have anything else in chat? I, I, I suddenly have a million screens open as, <laughs> as we all know <laughs> happens <Yeah>. regularly. <laughs> like mushrooms yeah um, they are like mushrooms i don't see any questions um on okay. chat um one of the things that's really helpful is and and if you get to send us questions or comments as github issues because then we don't lose track of them you can also just send a question through the mailing list and the the opening screen of dc tap on GitHub has a link to the mailing list. You have to subscribe or else it doesn't go through. But, um, but we really, really want GitHub issues. And then for the DC TAP program, it has its own GitHub and you can take all your questions there. Tom. Yes, I just wanted to say that uh, I know that there are some uh, programmers um, in the audience and um, uh, I would really welcome uh, pull requests. Um, if you just uh, see how um, something in the program doesn't work um, and, um, and can uh, submit a pull request, that would be great. There you go. Yeah, that's your homework. That's <laughs> from today. Anything else? Well, I think you know how to find us if thing, because things may occur to you later. And we will continue to uh, communicate through the mailing list, through GitHub, and through the Dublin Core site. Um, anything else, John, other than it's been great? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um... Uh, yeah, I, I can't think of anything. I mean, uh, you know, there, there's nothing like live live demos to discover the the small small gremlins lurking in 
Yes. Yeah. Exactly. But, uh, but we sort of figured of that. Yeah. <laughs> we sort of figured uh, but, that. But basically, but think, yeah. Yeah. That I mean, that was. That, I mean, there, there are a few things that we've discovered that were useful, valuable things to discover, and uh, um, and and so yeah, great to great to have a chance to share this with people and and um, and see see where things go. Yeah. Yeah. Share back with us. Any, any way you can. Okay, I think we, that's it then. Thank you so much everyone for being here. And uh, <laughs> I saw the little clappy hands up here. Um, and uh, good night to those of you who are in that kind of time zone. Or good morning or good day and have a good one. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, bye.